Hello everybody, this is Graham Anderson and today I'm going to be looking at Crystal Palace. Now there are two things that really drew me to this game. The first is the theme. I really enjoy learning about all the new and interesting ideas that are on display at the World's Fair or the World's Expo. And this game takes place in 1848 to 1851, the time during the first World's Fair in London. Each person represents a different country, competing to get the most fame by the end of the fair. Now the other thing that drew me to this game was actually the main mechanism. Each player starts with some dice and you're going to be using them for worker placement. But you can set your dice to whatever number you want each round. But the catch is you have to pay for the pips. So you'll not be able to have four sixes in every single round or you'll quickly be racking up the loans. So knowing when to have a high die or two by watching what your other opponent's doing is the key. So did this game turn out to be a winner? Let's get it to the table, see how it's played and then come back for my final thoughts on Crystal Palace. Here's Crystal Palace set up for three players. Each player takes the following pieces of their chosen color. Six dice, six assistants, five player tokens, two buzz tokens, and a victory point tile. You start each game with only four dice, so place the other two off to one side. Take a random player mat and place a token on the zero newspaper spot and an assistant on the lowest space of the objective track. Each player will also receive a treasure chest, 40 pounds, one gear, and one energy token. Arrange the eight tiles in ascending order in the middle of the table. Shuffle the patent cards face up and place one patent on each spot in the patent office. Next, separate the research tiles based on the color of their backside, and the green ones go with the British Museum and place a face-up one in each spot. The violet research tiles are sorted by their colored boxes on the reverse side. Place the blue box ones face down next to the patent office, and the orange ones next to the reform club. Shuffle the shares and piles according to their dates, and place the spring 1849 on each space of the bank, and return the rest of the spring 1849 ones to the box. Each player puts one of the tokens in the leftmost space of the Westminster tile, then shuffle the orange character cards and place them face up next to the Reform Club and fill all the spaces on the Reform Club tile. Choose a publisher tile at random and place it on the London Times. Then place three tickets on the space on the Port of London. The pocket watch, gears, energy tokens and money are placed nearby. Shuffle the loans face down into a stack and finally put the appropriate number of gears into the black market based on the player count. The administration board is placed off to one side. The flyers are sorted by color, then shuffled and one randomly placed on each matching color. Players place a token on the five of the victory track, four on the income track, and zero on the buzz track. Also, both of the players' buzz tokens are placed on this board as well. Let's have a quick look at one of the players' mats. The flag shows which country you represent, and you'll see a monument of that country. In the middle of the player mat is where you'll place your research and loans. For each space that is not filled at the end of the game, you're going to be losing two points. Here is where you have objectives you can obtain during the game to achieve end of game scoring, and each country is different in their objectives. On the right is the newspaper track, where well, you're going to be tracking your newspapers and shows you what you can spend your collected newspapers on. Here we'll tell you how to buy or sell gears and or energy with the market. And across the bottom we'll show you the phases of the round. The player with the most victory points will win the game at the end, and you'll get victory points by building patents and recruiting characters during the game and progressing along the buzz track will also gain you points every round. At the end of the game, you're going to get points for having completed your country's objectives, covering your research spaces as to not get negative points, and being ahead on the buzz track and being ahead on the black market track. Now, there are five rounds of the game, and each round has seven phases. The first phase, each player will take their dice and secretly decides what number they want on each die. When you are done, place your treasure chest on top. When all players are done, reveal. You now have to pay the bank the total value of all your dice combined. If you do not have enough money, you must take a loan. The player with the highest value goes first, and the player with the lowest value will receive one newspaper and adjust their token accordingly. In phase two, players will take turns to place their dice onto the different locations on the board. You must place a die so its value is equal to or higher than the value printed on that location. If there is a benefit or cost, receive it right away when you place your die. You do not have to place all your dice and you can pass at any time and this will end the phase for you, but you do not receive any money back for the dice not placed. During this phase you might also get an assistant action, so let's quickly talk about assistance and black market. When you get an assistant action you can either move your assistant ahead one level on your objectives if you have met the requirement, or you can take a black market action, which is to either move one of your assistants up one level and pay the indicated cost, or place a new assistant on the lowest free space of the black market and pay that cost. During phase 6, you'll receive the benefits from where your assistants are in the black market track. 
But during phase two, whenever you place a die, you can also move one of your assistants down to the next lowest free space on the black market track. And if the assistant was on level three or higher before you move them down, you will receive one gear from the yellow banner if there are any left. If at any time all the spaces in the black market are filled, the market busts and all players will remove their assistants from the track except for the assistant that caused the market to bust. Let's get back to the game. During phase three, you'll be resolving all the locations in ascending order. The player with the highest die value will move their die to the leftmost brown action square and take the action. If there is a tie, the leftmost highest die that was placed previously will be placed first. If there is a bonus on the action space, receive that bonus immediately. If there is a negative amount, you have to pay that before you can take the action. If you do not want to use your die at the location, you can pass, but will not receive anything back from that die, and then the next highest die will be placed. If you cannot take an action with your die because all the brown action spaces are full, you will receive one pound in compensation. Let us quickly go through the action spaces. The patent office allows you to take a patent card. These are not automatically refilled and you place it blue side up next to your board. You do not have to pay anything for it now, but it will show you what it will cost during phase five if you want to build it then. At the British Museum, choose one of the available research tile and place it on your player mat. These research tokens will tell you on the left side which phase it will activate or it could be an immediate action to take. The Bank of England, you'll choose one of the available shares which will usually raise your income and victory points. At Westminster, you'll advance your token one space and immediately, and only once, gain the bonus indicated on the space. At the Reform Club, you'll choose one of the available characters and immediately pay you the price in the top left-hand corner of the card. Let's have a quick look at these character cards. Now, on the front side, you have a name and a number. The red banner is the cost, and the blue banner is the number of victory points you'll get depending on which year you hired them in. The gray banner at the bottom left will show you any immediate bonuses that you receive when hired, and the bottom right will be the ongoing abilities. There is also a link to prototypes that show which ones will get a bonus when you hire this character. And across the bottom of this card is going to be the wages you have to pay during phase 4 each round. The different colors match where your token is on the Westminster tile. The back of the card will also just show the duplicate information from the front side that you need for the ongoing usage of the card. Now the London Times tile will give you buzz based on the current round and how well you did in the individual category. You will only get this bonus when you action a die here. The Port of London will give you a one-time action and can be used once per round. You can take two assistants, two gears, an additional die of your color to be used at the starting of phase one next round, or you can exchange your die for victory points. In that case, take a ticket, place it on your die in the leftmost empty space, and receive the indicated victory points plus the die value. And lastly, the Waterloo Station. Place your die onto a free location and receive the indicated bonus. Once all the actions have been completed, we move to phase four. This is where you have to pay for any characters you've hired based on the bar across the bottom of the card and where you are on the Westminster track. If you cannot afford to play your characters, you must take a loan. Then you can activate any other phase four abilities. In phase five, you can convert your blueprints into prototypes. Each player can only build two prototypes per round. Let's have a quick look at these prototype cards. You have the name and number of the card across the top, then the cost to build a prototype on the red banner, and the victory points for which year you build the prototype in on the blue banner. It will list which characters will give this prototype a bonus. If you have the listed characters, you'll receive four bonus points. Finally, across the bottom, we'll show you what happens when the prototype is built. And when you build it, you will apply all of these effects, both good and bad, to one player, and that player could be yourself. This is a one-time action and only happens when you build the prototype. After you have built your prototype and applied the effects to one player, place it face down next to your board. We then move on to phase six. First, receive the number of pounds as indicated on the income track. Then, move your income marker down three steps. For every steps you can't move down, you have to pay one pound to the bank. Then, any of your permanent effects with the green banner, which will be from your research tiles or your assistance in the black market, apply those effects now. And finally, any bonuses from the buzz track, you'll receive them now. And I'll talk a bit more about the buzz track in a little bit. Finally, we go into phase seven, which is the preparation for the next round. Refill gears in the black market and move all assistance down one level in the black market. Take back all of your dice. Then you're gonna remove all remaining cards, research tiles, and shares and refill with new ones and move the round tracker one space. Before we talk about end of game scoring, I did wanna quickly mention loans and the buzz track. Whenever you need to pay any amount of money and you do not have it, you can always take a loan. Draw a loan at random and receive 10 pounds. Place it on your board face up and you can pay back the loan at any time by paying 10 pounds back to the bank and flip your loan tile back over. 
Loans will always cost you victory points. Unpaid loans will always cost you more, but even paid back ones will still cost you 5 victory points at the end of the game. Now onto the buzz track. Whenever you receive buzz, move your token that many spaces on the buzz track. If you land or move over a flyer space, you'll immediately get that bonus. If you move onto or over a poster space, then you have the option to place one of your two buzz tokens. That means during each income phase you'll receive the bonus from the posters where you have your buzz tokens. But once placed, buzz tokens cannot be moved and you must decide as soon as you move onto or over the poster to place your buzz token. The first person to arrive at space 40 on the buzz track will move their token to the first place section and so on. You do not have to reach space 40 as the end of the game buzz track is based on relative positioning, but space 40 will give you a bonus. At the end of 5 rounds, the game ends. You can now pay back any loans and exchange your leftover energy, gears and newspapers for £1 each. For every £10 you have left over, you can convert them to a £10 note and place it onto an empty research space on your board. Then you'll gain points for the relative position on the buzz track. The person furthest ahead gets 6 points, then 4, etc. Then, in the black market, the player with the highest assistant will get 3 points, then 2, then 1. Finally, on your player mat, you'll gain victory points for the highest level of objective you were able to complete, and only the highest level. You do not receive any points for the levels you have already passed. And finally, you're going to lose points for any loans, both open and paid back, and you'll also lose 2 points for every uncovered research space on your board. Then, the player with the most victory points is the winner. Let's get back to see what I thought about Crystal Palace. First, theme and components. As I previously said, I think I may be biased towards this theme, but I felt it really came through. You know, trying to bring patents into prototypes to show off, or having characters in your employee bring different services, of course, at a price, and manipulating a buzz track all feels mm, fairly thematic. The components are good quality and are easy enough to read once you understand how they work. The iconography may take a little getting used to, but you know what, it's simple enough to explain. Now, I do like that there is a separate book for some of the components in the game. So if you have any questions over, you know, what this prototype does or what this character special ability does, there's a place to look it up. Now, not all the cards, um, like for example, the character cards are on the back, not all of them are here, but there's enough here, especially the more complicated ones are outlined here. So it's nice to have this. Now, I both like and dislike the module layout of this table. Uh, I do like that each area has a tile for the different player count. So you only place down tiles on their sides that match the player count. So there's never any confusion of, oh, you know, is this space open or not for three players? But on the other hand, as you saw from the walkthrough, it takes up a lot of space. Now, when I have taught this uh, to people, I kind of have to reassure them that, you know what, it's not as complex as it looks. Even though there's a wall of stuff they have to wade through, it's really not that difficult once you understand. Now the cards, both their prototypes and the characters are good. Now I did find that it fun that each one is uh, unique and it's based on you know different real and literary ideas and characters. The art is good and the design itself is well laid out. Now on to the gameplay. Now this is definitely a mid-weight Euro game, but the game can be fairly front-loaded. And by that I mean there's a lot to explain before you can really sit down and play the game. The setup I found though after a few plays was actually fairly quick. But, you know what, let's start off with some of the negative aspects uh, of the game, and we'll get those out of the way first. I think my biggest issue could be the turn order structure with the, highest, uh, with, with the higher player accounts. Now, the person that goes first in the round is the person who bid the most. I mean, I get that. That makes sense. But then turn order is clockwise from there. So if I bid the second amount, I'm not necessarily going to be going second. Or... If I bid the least, I still got my newspaper, but I maybe, maybe I go second in the round just to paste, uh, based on where I sit in relation to the player who bid the most. I'm not sure why there's not a variable turn order based on the bids or some other mitigation factor. It just kind of felt out of place for me in this style of game. Now, the other issue some people had I played with was the take that aspect of a heavier Euro game. Now, this game can be fairly tight, but there's a fair number of ways to mess with your neighbors. First is the dice placement. Now, if I think that you want to take a certain action, but you've only got low dice left, maybe I place one of my higher dice in the same tile that you want to go to, but I'll place it on the one or higher, and not on the space reserved for, let's say, the five or higher. This means I've stopped you from being able to place your die there, even though there was a spot open that I could have used. I had two options. I took the one that hurt you. For me, this is part of worker placement angst that I really enjoy. If you really want to use a space, you have to do it fast or have a high enough die value that you're almost guaranteed to get that action or at least be able to place your die. But there can be times when you're planning to place a die somewhere, you know, during the middle of the round, and another player placed the only spot you can place your die in at that location, just because they can. 
But again, for me, I didn't find this as an issue as I enjoyed that part of the game. You know, trying to outthink your opponents and figuring out what I absolutely needed to get and the ones that, you know, maybe have a backup plan for that die. But the other take element, uh, take that element that I had more of a problem was, was with the patent cards. When they are built, the effects have to play, be applied to one person. If you're not watching the blueprints the other players have on the go, you might be sideswiped when something goes into the prototype and you weren't expecting to be hit with that. And since the blueprints don't have to be turned into prototypes in the round they acquire, you might not know when this is going to happen. Quite often, you're, you know, you're counting out your resources, money to see how you can pay for your characters or build a patent next round. Then kind of out of nowhere, you get hit with someone else's uh, patent that they just uh, created into a prototype. Now, the patent, uh, the patent cards are both good and bad, but they can definitely throw off your plans. So I kind of wasn't a big fan of that. Now, neither one of these things was a game breaker for anybody I played with, but a few of them said that they were not fond of those aspects. So let's get on to parts I did like. I think by far my favorite part is the dice setting and placement at the beginning of the round and trying to figure out what other players are trying to go for. If I see a really good prototype card or character card that will work for what I currently have, then I definitely want to go there first with, you know, one big number. Maybe I want to set a whole bunch of big numbers so if I get to go first with a high number. But if I see other players are low on cash, maybe I can get with a lower total or lower numbers in general. The fact that you are also never completely blocked out of placing a die, and I felt that no matter where you place your die, you're probably going to be getting something good if you can action it, that there never was, I found, never a wasted round, which I appreciated. But the angst caused by the early phases, for me, was just at the right level. Will I be able to place your die? And then after I've placed my die, will I be able to action it? Putting out a one or two, then watching the other players kind of place uh, maybe a higher die, but if there's still an action spot left after all players had done, then I was able to use my one die to get an action, which maybe I wasn't expecting, but it's definitely going to be a benefit. The flow of the game actually uh, also works quite well. You go from one to eight and resolve the actions one by one. The actions themselves are fairly quick to resolve. Generally, when placing your die, you know exactly what you want from that area, so resolving it is quick. Now, there is a fair bit going on in the game, which is why I would put this at, you know, to, you know mid, mid heavy weight, as you need to be dealing with a few different aspects uh, going on at the same time in the game. I've not seen anybody win by focusing on one thing, so you need to be spreading out, but you can't spread out to everything because you can't be doing everything all the time. Picking and choosing what to focus on is the key. And this brings up my last minor negative to the game, and that's the randomness. There's the randomness of the cards that come up and the loans. Sometimes it feels that the people getting bonuses to their characters just down to luck. They weren't planning on building that prototype, but hey, that prototype came up that works with my character, so I'll just grab it. So they just happen to grab it at the right time. And the loans, you know, the unpaid loans range from minus eight to minus 10, but I'm not exactly sure why they're different. I mean, you get the same benefits from the loans, but you might get a different number of negative points for having an open loan. Now, finally, I want to talk about the replayability of the game. I found it to be fairly high. During all the plays I have done, I have not found myself kind of reverting back to the same combos or exactly the same strategy. And this really comes down to the variable setup. You know, the countries are randomly distributed, which gives you uh, one different objectives. The cards are random in the way they come up. The research tokens, the bank share, uh, bank share tokens, the buzz track flyers, they're all different each time I play. And I'm honestly still at the discovery stage of this game. I'm still finding new ways to, to uh, play and to try and to focus on each time I play this. The game plays in about one to two hours, depending on the player count. And I think that actually is the good amount of time for this game. I will say that I really enjoy this game at two players, as it seems to take some of the randomness of the take that out of the game, and that turn order kind of makes more sense. You know, highest bid goes first, and the other player gets a newspaper. So, would I recommend this game? I would. This is a good, solid, fun Euro game with an interesting theme. If you go into, into it knowing those few caveats I had mentioned previously, which I'm sure, you know what, if they are a major issue for you once you've played, you might be able to house rule some of them. I think you're really going to enjoy this one with that understanding. But that's it for the moment. Until next time, thanks for watching. Thanks so much for watching another Dice Tower video. If you enjoy our videos, subscribe to the channel for more fun, comprehensive board game coverage. Also, consider joining us at one of our events. Come to Dice Tower Retreat, a small, intimate gathering where gaming is king. Join us for Dice Tower Cruise, the largest board game cruise. Attend Dice Tower West in Las Vegas for gaming fun on the West Coast or Dice Tower East in Orlando in sunny Florida. Dice Tower Conventions, the friendliest gaming conventions on Earth. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.